in the chat box. Hello, everyone. We're very happy to have everybody here with us today. This is going to be a very special session. Uh, many of you know the guest. Many of you have seen the guest during uh, sessions online, festivals of literature. Maybe some of you have seen him live. Our special guest tonight is poet Anthony Anaxagoru, live from London. The session today is called Empire, Diaspora, and Family in Anthony Anaxagoru's After the Formalities. The poet will give a reading from his latest poetry collection called After the Formalities, with the focus being around how empire, diaspora, and family shape people. Who is Anthony Anaxagoru? Our poet is a British-born Cypriot poet, fiction writer, essayist, publisher, and poetry educator. His poetry has been published in Poetry, The Poetry Review, Poetry London, New Statesman, Granta, and elsewhere. His work has also appeared on BBC Newsnight, BBC Radio 4, ITV, Vice UK, Channel 4, and Sky Art. His second collection, After the Formalities, published with Penned in the Margins, is a poetry book society recommendation and was shortlisted for the 2019 T.S. Eliot Prize. It was also a Telegraph and Guardian Poetry Book of the Year. In 2020, he published How to Write It with Murky Books. I have a copy of it here. A practical guide fused with tips and memoir, looking at the politics of writing as well as the craft of poetry and fiction along with the wider publishing industry. He was awarded the 2019 H-100 Award for Writing and Publishing and the 2015 Groucho Maverick Award for his poetry and fiction. In 2019, he was made an honorary fellow of the University of Roehampton. Anthony is artistic director of Outspoken, a monthly poetry and music night held at London South Bank Center and publisher of Outspoken Press. So it is a great honor to have you with us tonight, Anthony. Thank you. And, uh, thank you so much for making it. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to leave the floor to you to go ahead. Cool. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's afternoon here, but uh, wherever you are, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Who knows where anyone is anymore? Um, good to see everyone. Thanks for coming along. So, yeah, the, the plan is that I, um, I'm i going to talk a little bit about the book um, after the formalities and the kind of process behind the writing and then kind of expand on some of my thinking behind the book and how that relates to empire and the family. And then I'm going to read some poems from here and then take some questions. So um, if there is questions as and when we go along, please feel free. You can put them in the chat box if you want. And I usually just kind of riff off them. Um, or we might have like a 15 minute segment at the end where we can get into it. So um, yeah, I my family is of uh, Cypriot heritage. Uh, why is that important? Um, it's a question that somebody asked me the other week. You know, we put so much emphasis on um, on who we are and identity, identity politics, um, both for the good and for the bad. And I kind of feel that my relationship to myself was kind of defined when I was young, in the sense that I couldn't I couldn't speak English till I was five. I was raised by my grandmother. Uh, she was kind of like my um, daycare, I guess. I would go to her house. My parents couldn't afford a, um, a kind of babysitter. And they, had, they both had to work, working class Cypriot family. And so I was raised by her. She spoke Cypriot Greek. Uh, and so for the most of my childhood, that's what I spoke. And I think I became quite interested in Cyprus from a young age because of how it was perceived in my household and in my family. Um, and the emphasis that Cyprus had on who we were, the focus that it put. I, sometimes I feel that we are overrepresented by our ethnicities, by our nationalities, but then at the same time, I think with Cyprus, you never really get to understand the complexities of being a Cypriot. And I say that with an understanding of world history, colonialism and empire and how it all kind of plays out. And I think that with Cyprus, because of where it sits in the Levant and because of its colonial history, 
there's so many different elements to consider and it's a bit different you know like every group of people at some point would be would have been subjugated by another group of people that a lot of that depends on proximity um you know the kind of neighboring countries or the empires that were surrounding it at the time but i think with cyprus what's so fascinating is that it's had imperial um kind of gloves on it from antiquity but those empires have been from europe asia north africa and the middle east they've kind of come from all around and i think it's that disparity that makes it really interesting and the only places i've ever read about cyprus where i felt that there is a, an appropriate amount of nuance that has been placed on looking at that history that goes beyond nationalism of the 1950s and the very anti-british sentiment from 1878 um and now that obviously the, the the division in Cyprus between the north and the south is in academia. Academia has really been the only place where I felt that's happening. The problem is, is that that doesn't really impact the mainstream or people's kind of general thinking about how they identify. And so where that fits in, the amount of emails that I get every week from people asking me, are Cypriots white? Are Cypriots European? Are Cypriots Greek? Are they Turkish? Are Turkish people white? Are Greek people white? Are Greek Cypriots white? Uh, and then the other one is, you know, are we part, do we say we're European because we're part of the EU? Or, but the North isn't part of the EU. So what do they say? You know, it's so, there's so many questions regarding who we are. And there's so much confusion. Individual through individual will see the Cypriot self in a very different way. Uh, and so, yeah, that's kind of what's been driving my work for a long time. But it's interesting because I got into this through African race theory. So looking at uh, ancient Africa, looking at the empires of Mali and Benin and, and you know, uh, periods and civilizations that were hugely prosperous, then with European um, kind of colonization, it, it kind of sent me on this quest where I started looking at global history through an imperial lens um, and looking at countries and continents pre-coloniality and post-coloniality to see the difference that they had kind of that they had made and what's interesting with Cyprus is that it's never been pre-colonial it's never had a period where it's been pre-colonial because it's always been at the whim of another empire in fact the only period that it has had where it's been autonomous is between 1960 when it gained independence from the British and 1974 but even within that period, there was fighting the whole time. And the British, you know, they've got, there's two military bases in Cyprus now. Uh, there's a divided, it's a divided island. So, you know, like looking at autonomy at global history, I started getting really interested in Venezuela, in um, Simon Bolivar, and looking at those kind of projects of how Latin America was created, um, and then Africa, and then Asia, North Asia, Japan, it, and then it was, it's just so fascinating how kingdoms, civilizations and empires have come and fallen. And then war. You know, there's a great book up there uh, by Margaret Macmillan just called War. And it's a really interesting study on human nature and our relationship to conflict. Um, and so, yeah, that's really what's driven a lot of my stuff. But where does the family come in? So, uh, you know, like my academic curiosities lean towards those things that I've outlined. But then I think there's another side of it that I find also fascinating, and that is, you know, post-intergenerational trauma, epigenetics, how people that come from colonized countries, how they see themselves and how they see their children and so on and so forth. And this is what I think I'm really interested in because I know for a fact that when my family spoke about Cypriots, we were stupid, we were lazy, we were a bit thick. We spoke in a dialect that was a village dialect. It was agrarian. But then when they spoke about Greece, it was refined. It was cultured. It was civilized. The language was different. Omorphiseni glossa, which means the language has now become beautiful. Um, and there was a huge contrast between that self hatred that you internalize that when you read books like Sweet and Bitter Island that show you how the British created a particular culture in Cyprus it really is interesting how that is still playing out 
and that's not exclusive to the island. I think a lot of colonized countries have that still, you know, like the idea of shame, of being embarrassed of where you come from because, because you've made to be, you've, you've made to become that person to justify subjugation a lot of the time. And what was interesting with Cyprus is the British didn't really have an understanding of who the people were. So they'd come onto an island that was a it was a protectorate up until the, no, to the 20s, 1927, 1928, when it became part of the empire. But when they got when they took over from the Ottomans, they didn't know how to deal with these people because it wasn't just a case of subjugating and then giving them Christianity because the majority of people were already Orthodox. So they were like, what do we actually do here? There's no one to convert because they're already Orthodox. And I think along with Malta, Cyprus and Malta were the only two EU countries. Obviously, you've got Gibraltar and uh, Isle of Man and those countries, but you know, outside of that kind of proximity that were part of the British Empire. And how they had to deal with it was really quite interesting. Their argument was, the reason why we're here is to Hellenicize the island, to take it back to the ancient Greek days, because we don't really know what it is that we're doing here. So they saw Cypriots as a hybrid group of people, as a mongrel group of people that were made up of many different groups. So they thought it had its moment in antiquity when the Mycenaeans were here. So we're going to try and take it back to 2000 years and Hellenify the island, which is they tried to instill this kind of Grecian flair um, that they felt it lacked and obviously move away from the Ottoman influence, although they were friends with the Ottomans. They were paying them rent, essentially to lease the island and it was costing them a lot of money so um the family in that regard for me is patriarchy and i think patriarchy having a male don't forget empire was incredibly patriarchal i mean it was patriarchal and so the the, the kind of nexus between empire patriarchy and um violence are all the themes that i think i'm exploring in this book through the lens of a family. Yeah, it's partly my family, my relationship to my dad. And then I have a son in the book uh, later on, a son appears. And then it's a, almost like a tripartite, a relationship between my dad, myself and my son. And critics who have reviewed the book have signaled that it's a very masculine book. It's a very, it's a very male book dominated book and the women in the book the speak the characters the speakers have got very stereotypical roles and i think this was a conscious decision because if i'm going to create a world that is true to the world that i know i'm not going to moralize i'm not writing a, a moralizing text i'm writing a text that is responding to something to a cultural malaise and so i need to honor that by dramatizing and problematizing the people that are within that world, which are men. The women were never a, a problem. They never threatened me, the women in my life, in my family, but the men did. And so that's why that is. And also empire, as we said, is very male uh, dominated. So that's kind of like the, the thinking behind the book and what I was trying to get out of it. So let's read, let's read some poems now from here and then maybe we'll have some questions if there is any um I'll, I'll start with the opening one it's called uh it's called cause and to the burning i say my worry is a whole country i've been myself longer than my undoing heavy trunk of silverware museum glass polish portraiture of bent flags I'm here as my grandparents were, only with a moving mouth. During empire, my people were subjects first, citizens later. Once the vigilantes managed to zip up their coats, flames lambent. My grandmother died with umbrellas outstretched in her gut. My grandmother died. To be British is to be everywhere. Some roots have been in the earth for so long, they know only to call themselves earth. A worm's pink nipple bleeds into snow. My birth, my mother's brown skin. I'd already filled half myself with Britannia's air. It took them a month to find my name. Um, so this next one, 
is slightly closer to home in that it was inspired by the referendum of 2016. So this is kind of like a true event that happened. And then I kind of, I spent a year thinking about this poem, how it would look. It went through many different iterations before I, I managed to get to where we are with it now. If you see it kind of, it looks like very thin kind of lineation uh, down the page. Uh, it's called Uber. Door shuts, winds slap a magic tree around. A radio hums songs into us both. One of two phones rings. From an edge, he tells her he'll call back in a language half packed back when I assume things took a turn for the worse. A flag hanging from the rear view. I ask where. He says Mauritius. Returning my question, I say Cyprus, asking if he prefers it here. He says sleep is easier, the roads at night less congested. At the lights I ask about children. From his pocket he pulls a photo of a girl. I note the way her smile matches her mother's in the picture. Everyone's together, smiling. She turned nine last week, he said. It's been over five years. Now, rain. Wipers wave like a tired pair of arms. A car makes an emergency stop. A homeless man moves like a saw into traffic. When will you see her again? I ask. Soon. Soon. Now, traffic builds. The other way would have been quicker, he says. To our right, a van pulls up. Two men motion to lower windows. In rain, he does. We do. Go home, home, go home, home laughing up a storm front, then speeding off. He tucks his daughter back in, her mother, himself, gripping the wheel like a gun. How much can a pair of hands keep? One of two phones rings, declining the call. The song on the radio ends. An ad suggests a weekend break to Europe, turning it off, bringing us right into where we were, asking... What about you? Do you have children? Do you prefer it here? Um, okay, I'll read one more and then I'll read the last one because the last one's uh, quite long. Um, I'm, I've always been asked, you know, outside of, you know, people don't see your name, they ask where you're from. And even when they see your name, they just assume that you're from Greece. <laughs> um, and I was I was doing a, a reading for I think it was the British Council, maybe 2016, 2017, around about that period. And uh, I came off the stage and we were behind, you know, like backstage and everyone was talking and mingling. And there was loads of Democrats and not Democrats, uh, diplomats, probably Democrats as well um, in the in the house. And this lady came up to me um, and it was a really weird encounter because she said, young man, and she was much older. She must have been maybe her 70s, mid to late 70s. And she said to me, young man, I thought that was that was so powerful. Thank you so much for that reading. And I was like, oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the kind words. And then she said, can I ask you, where are you from? And I was, I, something happened. I don't know what happened to me, but I just kind of like, I was taken aback by the question. And I just said, um, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from London. And then she kind of put her her hand on um, on my elbow here <laughs> and then she kind of came in like really close as in to whisper something and she said no no where are you really from and it was such a weird <laughs> it's such a weird thing and then I got a little bit pissed off um and I, I felt I could feel myself getting angry and I just went oh I'm from North London and um and then she she got you know she could tell that I was being a bit facetious uh, and so yeah, she kind of, yeah, it was a weird thing. But I was thinking about that for a long time. And then when I was on the train home, I couldn't work out. I thought maybe I overreacted. And maybe it was just me projecting my kind of, you know, issues around this stuff onto her. And um, and I was trying to work out why I got so defensive about the whole thing. Aren't you, aren't you proud to be Cypriot? Aren't you proud to say, I am from Cyprus? Like, what is, you know, I'm British, but I'm also Cypriot. Um, and I couldn't work out if 
she was being malicious or if she was being curious. And I think that's what was bugging me is I wasn't sure where this was coming from or why you felt the need to ask. Um, so anyway, I wrote this poem that wrestles with that tension of, of trying to get, is this performative or is there something more, is it benign? And I'm just like, you know, over reading it, overthinking it. Poem is called A Line of Simple Inquiry. Follows in the traditional vein of questioning when one encounters a person or persons they perceive to be other. The famous public autopsy, at a dinner party, art gallery, gymnasium or local bakery. Three words light as a baby's finger. But where really? The taxonomy of difference along with the need or entitlement to ask so politely with one hand resting on the elbow, displaying caution, not wanting to infer with emphasis on assume as in to avoid causing offence, becoming more scrutinised every feature up against the light to your body under their knife. The question, again, so as to deduce, so as to allow the remarkable recalling of definitive histories, Ib Khaldun, Mansa Musa, Phyllis Wheatley and Al-Afghani, your people, as in extraordinary, as in don't take this the wrong way, as in don't take this to heart, but it's also fascinating. An appreciation, if you will, to announce so subtly, without hubris, the panoply of books read on the way we eat and live and love and bury our dead and really it's all just so interesting as if interest were a desperate thing scurrying across a mass grave an artifact snatched from an old warrior's hand neat wall text in a city museum to cast iron eyes over incredulity you don't look like the aquiline nose was the giveaway, skin thicker than animal sex that never cracks under God, and all those nuances, bloating the unfished ghosts of the sea, and all that hair. Is it natural? Is it yours? Is it real? To touch what I own, take what I see. There's a reason why my daddy told me to keep a stone between my fists when I fight, and really, it's all just too complicated. And everything's already been said much better by people who had it much worse. But look, is this your attempt to bid me farewell in my tongue? Are you here to help carry the burden of my name? Are your hands strong enough to lug it? We all know the stuck fish bone never meant any harm. Is that your hand still on my elbow? Hey, um... And I'll read, the, I'll read the title poem now uh, after the formalities. This was, I think it's the longest poem um, I've ever written. And it was, I agonized over this. It took months trying to get right. Um, and, and the premise of it is that I use race or the history of race as a, uh, as a pseudoscience, as a, as a social construct to... Um, to kind of as a point of departure to look at my own family's experience of race and uh, migration to the to the UK. So my grandparents came here in the late fifties when Cyprus was still a British colony, um, and my both my parents were born in Cyprus but moved to the UK when they were very young, you know, three to four years old. So that's the kind of relationship that we have. So this poem is called "After uh, the Formalities," and it's about seven six and a half to seven minutes long, depending on how quick I read it. I'll try and not read it too fast. Um, after the formalities. In 1481, the word race first appears in Jacques Debrez's poem, The Hunt. Debrez uses the word to distinguish between different groups of dogs. In that hard year, grandparents arrived on a boat with a war behind them and a set of dog leads, bullet holes in the sofa, burst pillows, split rabbits, passports bound in fresh newspapers, bomber planes, a dissenting priest, a money bag sucking worry. On the boat, grandmother anticipated England's winters with the others, slick snow on gold streets, grandfather grieved two dogs he'd left, pedigrees, blue bottles decaying at the base of their bowls. The dogs of England were different. The water, though, fine to drink. In 1606, French diplomat Jean Nicot 
added the word race to the dictionary to denote distinctions between different groups of people. Nicotine is named after him. In London, grandparents lived with only a radio, a lamp favouring the wall's best side, curtains drawn, Byzantine icons placed on paraffin heaters, arguing through whispers, not wanting to expose tongues, stories circulating. What neighbours do if they catch you saying, I'm afraid, in a language that sounds like charred furniture being dragged across a copper floor, grandfather. <laughs> always blew smoke out the lip of his window, so too did his neighbour, colourless plumes merging, how it's impossible to discern the brand of cigarette a single pile of ash derives from. In his 1684 essay, A New Division of the Earth, French physician Francois Bernier became the first popular classifier to separate humans into races using phenotypic characteristics. Mother's skin is the colour of vacations, her hair barefoot black, and islands only one way. Reports of racist attacks, father turns up the volume, turns us down, chews his pork, stings the taste with beer, tells mother to pass the pepper, there is never a please, he asks if she remembers the attack. The hospital, his nose, a Coca-Cola bottle picked from his skull. Yes, she mutters, the chase, dirty bitch, how we'll make you white, Aphrodite hard, dirty dog, trembling with the street light, please God, not tonight, the kids. In his essay of 1775 on the natural variety of mankind, J.F. Blumenbach claimed, that it was environment which caused the variety in humans. In the bathroom mirror, I spat blood from my mouth, quaver breath, suburban. My brother, desperate to piss, pulled the door open, asking what happened. He tried to fight and lost. Why? Because the island we come from is smaller than this. Their names are shorter pronounceable, so they exist. Even after their noses break, they still don't hook like ours. Their sun is only half peeled. He lifted his top to show me two bruises, to remind me of something, how history found its own way of surviving, a dark wash mixed with the whites spinning round and around. In the bathroom mirror, my brother spat blood from his mouth, Suvla breath and home, me desperate to piss, pulling the door open, asking what happened. He tried to fight and lost. Why? Because the island we come from is larger than this. Here, we chew up too much of their language, leave behind an alphabet of bones. We will never exist in their love songs. How many bruises does it take to make a single body? I left him, surviving history. A dark wash mixed with the white spinning round and around. In 1859, British naturalist Charles Darwin wrote, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. If the house phone rings after midnight, someone you know is dying, breathing in 10 black moons under a siren or belfry, from the wound in my uncle's back leaped the first atlas, blood escaping him like a phantom, bolting over the spiked gates of heaven, the knife half steel, half drunk, the motive, skin or prayer. We went to visit. In the window's condensation, his daughter wrote, Daddy, don't die on the water of her breath. That evening, my father came home, one hand trumpet, the other reef all his fists, the law. In his seminal book of 1911, Heredity in Relation to Eugenics, Charles Davenport wrote, two imbecile parents, whether related or not, have only imbecile offspring. She had the same color hair as Jesus. Most boys smile after. When we were done, I moved the blonde streak from my arm, wondering how much of my body was still mine. I smelt of rain on an old umbrella. My fingers are burnt factory. She asked if she was my first, and when I said yes, she smiled, pulling the covers up, whispering not to get too comfortable how her father would be back, the bed, a wet flag, the duvet, 
breaking news. On the shelf, a gollywog above her family portrait, poised like a saint. The Bengal famine of 1943 killed 4 million people. Churchill ordered food to be sent directly to British soldiers in Europe. On hearing the number of Bengalis who had perished, he asked, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? Outside the KFC, racists have always looked so sure to me, like weathermen driving his skull into mine like a belief. I saw how even evil can feel warm and smell good when close enough. A crowbar wedged against my throat. Slowly the lights began to wave, chips by my feet, black iron warming my skin so silently I could hear how suffering learns to soothe the jaws of antiquity. These men, irrational as any god, and me, emptying inside the promise of my oxygen tank. Those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad. We must be mad, literally mad as a nation, to be permitting the annual inflow of some 50,000 dependents who are, for the most part, the material of the future growth of the immigrant descended population, Enoch Powell, 1968. After the formalities, of course I said London, and of course he asked again. When I said Cyprus, he leaned into his chair, recalling a family holiday, the weather sublime, the people accommodating, particularly towards the English, how it was a shame about the Turkish thing and your parents. When did they enter here? In the late 50s, I replied. So before the Immigrants Act, yes, I said, before. Well, good for them, he said putting the lid on his pen, closing his pad, asking me to talk a bit more about my previous roles. In 2001, philosopher Robert Berlusconi wrote, the construct of race was a way for white people to define those who they regarded as other. In those days, I was required to fill out forms with multiple boxes, some I left blank. My father would notice my omission, filling in the white option with his black biro. I crossed it out, telling him I'm going with other. My mother, wearing the same sad skin as before, said, we are not white. The look he gave her was, snatching the form from me, the same X, dominating so much white. Let me tell you, nobody in their right mind need make themselves such an obvious target, he affirmed. It's amazing how ideas start out, isn't it? Nigel Farage, 2016. My grandmother will die somewhere in her skeleton, white sheeted, eye deform thick, her mouth all beetle. My family will gather round her body, all fig. My mother will look for coins, despite there being nothing for money to save. Another lady, dying the same, will goad our kind. Through thick tubes she'll scorn her voice, a blue bottle's hot wings, your all dogs, foreigners and dirty, outnumber us even in dying. The nurse will apologise for the whole of history, drawing the curtain. Mud is always the last thing to be thrown, a prayer reaching for the pride of an olive like a hint to hold. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was incredible. Content, delivery, presentation, everything. Thanks. There's a lot to learn as well. So um, I'm going to open, open the floor to questions. I already see Dr. Sabah, his hand is up. Um, Dr. Omar Sabah, Anthony is also a um, He's a British Lebanese, so he has also had a share of being in diaspora. And uh, he's a poet as well. So, Omar, do you have a comment Hi. or a question? Yeah. Well, first I want to say that was an amazing, amazing, amazing session. I mean, your, your poetry is so rich and it's full of so much tension that we really, you know, you engage us as well as your performance. But I, I've got a question actually, or a comment, which, quite, which I want to ask at the end of a little blurb, which is that your first poem, to your last poem. The first one was called Cause, I believe. Yeah. And a cause is obviously something that comes before an effect, but also something you work towards, right? Uh, and I, what I noticed was 
from the language you use, the richness of the language, the performance you gave it, and the conception, it's really, really like you're 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 really uh, energized by your material in the content and in the way you deliver it. And I want to ask, would that be the same way if it was, let's say, your your the second generation, your parents? What mm. I want to say was that I once had a friend who was doing World Englishes, a PhD in World Englishes. He told me there's a phenomenon where the third generation is more energized with origins than the second generation because by that time they've kind of they've gone further away from it, so they kind of like react more more forcefully back on the origin. So given that your parents, I think, were, were you told me, I think you said they, they came up three or four years old to the, to the UK, but they were pretty much, you know, um, they were less uh, than your, than the first generation. Yeah. They were they were standardized in the UK pretty much, right? Yeah. So how would they deal with the, the issues you're dealing with or would they not? And if they don't, then how do you make that difference? How do you make sense of that difference? I think that with my parents, with their generation, and when I speak, my, my parents are both in their 60s now, um, and, and when I speak to them, they they very much felt othered. Uh, my, my, I mean, what the poem alludes to is a racist attack that happened in Kentish Town in North London. My mum was nearly raped, um, and they didn't rape her because of the fact that they heard sirens. But these were skinheads that were get, you know, going around. And their purpose was to beat up anyone who they feel didn't look white. What was really interesting with this is that when, I, when they told me the story from a very young age, it, is, you know, it traumatized me just hearing them talk. My dad was hospitalized and my, this happened to my mom. Um, and my mom was 18, my dad was 21. And um, hearing them talk about it made me realize that I will never experience that. As a third generation, I will never experience something that, intense uh, and that traumatic but what's interesting is how they both internalized it my dad he would say they were xenophobic my mom would say it's because we didn't look white and this is what's really interesting is that the distinctions between how you present my mom is dark my mom has very brown skin like she people think she's asian she's indian they think that she might be moroccan uh, and my dad looks italian and so when you've got these distinctions with how people present um it changes the way that you think about events such as that. So I kind of feel that my experience of that, it kind of fortified my argument is right, that you yeah. can't cut the identity down to just being black or white because these things happen. And they were with my dad's brother, who's also very dark and was also be and, and they're with an Indian guy as well. So they were all together. They just left the cinema or something. And that's when the attack happened. But I think that's when I really started to think, generationally how you how I think about myself and obviously I was born at a time in the 80s no one really spoke about this stuff after 9-11 when people from the Middle East became incredibly racialized in a way that hadn't really existed before that that changed the conversation around the region of the world that I come from as well because you know like we're we're in the Middle East too so it's yeah it is it is really interesting Um, I don't know if that answers the question. But no, it does. It does. Um, it does very much so. I mean, I think, uh, but what was interesting is that you're saying that the second generation compounds the third generation rather than being a kind of a diff uh, like an absolute difference, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> what, what? I, loved, I loved your work. It's wonderful. It's really, really evocative and, and powerful. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. The one thing that I realized is I don't know anyone else might feel this as well is that because I was raised. I speak the Cypriot dialect, which is what my grandma spoke. So when I go back to Cyprus now, I'm kind of stuck in the 1930s because the way that I speak is the way that my grandma spoke. So when I go there, they just said, you, they kind of say, like, you speak like a villager. And I'm like, I don't. I just speak. Like, this is the language that I speak in. But because it's not standardized modern Greek, they just kind of assume that this guy's a little bit, you know, he's like a bit dated. And that's what's interesting is that you kind of, in the diaspora, you adopt an almost like atavistic kind of very traditional sense of what you, of what you are and that sense is literally from your grandparents whereas when you go to the uh, the country now they've literally moved on like decades from where from where they were right uh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I can relate That's to that because my family in the states i mean they're they're much more traditional than we are because we stayed in the middle east that's where we live and we've been here for a while but as Anthony mentioned, the dialect as well. So my grandmother and my cousins, they spoke the same way. Uh, whereas my family spoke differently. 
of the Lebanese Arabic. Right, so that's, that's a very uh, fascinating uh, subject. Uh, there are so many more comments in the chat box. Anthony, would you want to read some more and then leave the comments till the end, or would you want to take a little pause with the comments and then read? Um, how was your experience and background affect your sense of hope? Um, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Like, I think home is, is, a, is a condition. Um, I think that's what Baldwin, I always nick a Baldwin line when it comes to that. Um, but yeah, I think home is more of a condition. And, you know, like you can, I, I you know, Webb Du Bois coined the term like a dual, a double consciousness. And I think that when you do have, you know, British, Cypriot, American, Lebanese, like you're essentially navigating two identities. Um, there was a thing about, you know, I don't know if you saw it, David Lammy, who's the MP in Tottenham here in, in London. Um, he went on a talk radio and, and the caller called up and said, you know, you're not English because you're you're African Caribbean. So you're not English. Um, and I, I really I think there's such murky water like where you belong um, and how the English saw you when the English went to your country. They saw you as a subject. You definitely weren't English. But I think there's this idea of reclaiming the narrative. Personally, I don't identify as English. I think English people are a race of people that kind of their lineage is the Anglo-Saxon group. Um, I'm British. That's a nationality. Um, my passport says British. That's it. So I do make those distinctions. But when I go back to Cyprus, it doesn't feel like home. When I walk around London, I feel home. And, and I think that's the fundamental difference. It's what I know. When I walk, like, they know that you're not from there. When you go to Cyprus, they know how you dress, how you walk, how you move your hands. They know that you're not from there. So it's, it's interesting having a place that your ancestors come from, but you don't feel that kind of bond with. I connect with Cyprus intellectually, but I think as a, as a place, locality, it's a different experience. Right. Uh, we have a question from Miriam Sese. Miriam, who's joining us from Italy today, asks, is manhood linked to self-discipline? I mean, as the ability to control male energy. Interesting question. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's, I mean, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of men in the world who are very dangerous. Um, and, 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 and as we know, both on a domestic scale, but on an international scale as well. Um, uh, I, I kind of think that the male condition globally, I could, I might be inclined to argue it's a global, it's endemic in the way in which men are conditioned to one behave towards each other, but two to talk to women. Um, that I kind of feel that it's something that you do have to work out from. I think every man that I know, and I don't mean this in a woke sense. I don't mean to kind of be moralistic. I just mean in a sense of common decency. Um, of just working out from a place where you, you're socialized to be entitled, you're socialized to be a particular way. I come from a very patriarchal family. Um, it's very male dominated. The women are constantly subjugated or belittled or berated in some shape or form. Um, and it has its problems. It has a lot of problems. So I kind of feel that there is a level, maybe not self-discipline, maybe self-awareness, is kind of what you need and to understand your position your proximity to other people and how that works um and yeah i mean you know there's theological arguments that say that patriarchy goes back to the abrahamic religions and god being man and so on and so forth or god being genderless in some religions but then i, I also feel that there is the conversations i've had with men there is a lot of biological determinism that I don't agree with. Like I think it's a bit of a pseudoscience, you know, that men are just naturally built to do this and women are naturally built to do that. It's like you can't, I mean, Franz Boas coined the term cultural relativity in the late 19th century. And that's kind of what it is because when you look at different groups that are more matriarchal, behavior, behavioral patterns are determined by culture, not genetic. Like you're not predisposed to be a particular behave a particular way behavior is learned i think people know that it's a bit of a truism so yeah i think it's more mindfulness than anything else mm -hmm. what's this one at the beginning of the conference you mentioned that you get a lot of emails asking thank you <laughs> yeah. yeah well anyway um in your it, it seems to me that in your poetry 
um, the, the modes of masculinity uh, endorsed in your poems somehow have prepared the way for the language of manliness, no? So I mean, energy, duty, uh, leadership. Um, yeah. In a way, it seems that you uh, privilege the life of the body rather than the mind, but I guess. <laughs> so the real question is, I wonder whether uh, you are not willing to blur the binaries of male and female. Um, no, I do. I think I, do. I mean, if you asked, if you were to ask me as an individual what I think, I don't think that they are binaries. I think that we're, we're fluid. I think history shows that. I think society shows that. But again, what my poems wrestle with is what is culturally, what is kind of accepted in a more nefarious way. And, and I, again, I think it's important to distinguish like poems that are moralizing that are preaching, that are making an argument and poems that are looking to wrestle with two tensions. And I think that you can have two truths. You know, a poem can hold two, three different things that are all true at the same time. In the fact that one person's truth is another person's fiction. Um, you know, my truth is very different from Donald Trump's truth, but does that mean that his truth is, is untrue? So I kind of feel that poems can be these agent provocateurs and there is room for transgression. Um, and I don't know if we should limit a poem's function to being an instrument that you moralize with, that we try to you know, you proselytize. I think that's the role of scripture. That's the role of dogma. I don't think that's the role of art. I think art should get into these places and should challenge binaries, which is kind of what I'm doing. You overstate the fact that you come from a culture that is male dominated and that these binaries are perceived as being fixed when we know that they're not. And that's really what I'm trying to dig into with a lot of the writing in that book. Thank you and congratulations on your brilliant talk. Thanks very much. Um, we have some comments, um, some earlier comments, a comment from Glenda uh, joining us from Ireland. Glenda said, last poem read was so powerful and true to experience. Uh, Carol from California says, I'm noticing the way the poem so far and with a sense of reverberating suspension, really powerful imagery and narrative pulse. Uh, Hedi Habra, uh, also a poet uh, living in diaspora, she's Lebanese American, says, you express so well the effect, effect of these powerful poems. Oh, that's for Carol. Uh, and Hedi again gives you a comment and says, the line, where really is so familiar to my own experience. Uh, Glenda says, I'm doing my family history and learning that where I am from is incredibly varied and complex and amazing. I'm writing poems about it. Do you feel the same way, Anthony? Do you feel the complexity and the fascination? I do, and, and I'm not, I don't, I don't set out to try and resolve anything. I think it's really important that I don't try to, I'm not offering solutions. Um, I think that's the job of policymakers and, you know, people that work in legislation. I don't know if artists are kind of obliged to offer solutions. I think art is very much a response to something. It's very much a, a provocation, uh, an interrogation, an inquiry, a curiosity that is kind of being expanded on. So, yeah, that's kind of how I, that's kind of how I see it. I very much uh, agree with that. And it's these preoccupations and these curiosities, I think, that keep inspiring more and more work. Absolutely, I agree to that. Uh, we have a comment from Joan Liotta, who is Italian-American. Um, Joan says uh, that she also feels the same way. I recall a specific time in Tennessee where I reacted like Anthony did and refused to give them the answer they sought. Um, I like how you you called it a public autopsy, the question. Yeah. So it's like, do you really feel that there's like a killing of the individual and then, you know, this kind of the, the post-mortem investigation or what would you call it a, um, a public autopsy? I mean, it is an autopsy because there's some sort of a killing and uh, public yeah. because it's a stranger, right? Yeah, it's this idea of like you feel that you're being looked at. And you feel that people are looking at your nose, that they're looking at your forehead, that they're looking at the, your hair, and they're trying to discern where you come from. 
And it's the idea that you're essentially dead because they're, you're becoming objectified and objectification creates a social death. And so through the social death of objectification, it's now the autopsy where I'm going to literally open you up to try and discern what part of the world you come from by using phenotypic kind of signifiers. Oh, your nose is a bit big. You could be Jewish or your mouth is like this. You could be that. And it's just like you end up falling into these racial tropes that are completely terrible, but people do it. And when you start looking back at racial history, Hitler did it. But then J.F. Blumenbach did it. You had anthropometry, the measuring of skulls, the cephalic index, the brain size was apparently due to the size of your head, different phenotypes, different head shapes. All this kind of stuff has been used from the invention of race. Um, and I feel that we're not anywhere kind of past that point. It's still very much that when they, oh, where are you, where are you from? And that question comes with this gaze that I really, really makes me feel uncomfortable. And so that's kind of what that line alludes to, yeah. Okay, um, Ahmed Sharafuddin says these tones are so powerful, so interesting. Uh, Hadi again says the sound of a language branding the other instilling reticence, if not mistrust slash fear. I think Hadi's referring to the part where you compare the language to charred furniture, the sound of charred furniture. Yeah, 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 it was, um, yeah, I think it was the idea of like to the foreign ear, the English ear, what I, you know, it was that idea of how how do you make your language sound to someone who can't hear it and for them it's like someone's just pulling charred furniture across a copper floor there's a lot of references to copper that's what cyprus is it's you know the island of copper so all the references to copper are from kipros is i think copper um so yeah or kipris in in turkish and kipro in greek so yeah uh, you have a comment from Perla Kantarjan, who is a, an Armenian Lebanese journalist and writer. She, uh, she says, breathing in 10 black moons. So I guess she liked this part. She's uh, commenting on it. Um, Kayla Troy. Kayla says, bravo, gets better every time. Hedi again says, impressive and poignant to Anthony. Carol says, really riveting and expanding, a confluence of histories. Maryam Wajdi, an Emirati poet, says, perfect. Mm -hmm. Anthony Huen says, a very important poem. Andy Jamil says, it's really powerful and incredible how you talk about cultural diversity. Do you believe that people should stick to their culture and heritage, even though what they do might seem illogical or pointless in today's world? Um, I don't think we should police people into writing about what they know, uh, particularly for art. I mean, it stifles that kind of creative endeavor. I think you can make art, but, you know, do it well and, and do it with kind of rigor and with nuance and with concern and consideration for your subject. I think that's the issue. I think that when a white writer tries to tell a black story, they get it wrong. When a white writer tries to write about racism, a lot of the time they get it wrong because of the fact that there is no nuance, there is no concern or consideration for the black person within the, who's the subject of the poem. And that's where it kind of, so I think, you know, people should be free. I don't think we should start demarcating where you can and can't go. But then I think at the same time, you know, you have an obligation to do your work properly and to be as considerate as you can be. And you might get it wrong and you have to bear the consequences. But then again, get it wrong by whose standards, who's the arbiter? You know, that's when it becomes, that's when it gets really interesting. And you, you don't know that, that like you have to resign yourself to the fact that you won't know who the arbiter is. Like the one, one black person might love the Tony Hoagland poem that caused Claudia Rankin to write Citizen. And another black person might think this is just, this is just racial diatribe. Like what is going on? Um, so yeah, you, you never know. But I think make it. Hi. Uh, some more comments rolling in. Nandi says, this was very amazing. I enjoyed every second of it. Glenda says, I'm very glad to discover your work. Uh, Hedy asks, where can we purchase your book in the US? So Anthony, you might want to share that in the uh, in the chat box towards the end of the session. Yeah, you can, on my website, I think oh. if you go on my website, I, can, I think someone put a link in there actually. Um, oh, okay. it should, 
ship to the US um, and I'll sign them. I've got some copies up there, so I'll I'll sign them and put them in the post for you. Okay, that's great. Um, Sheikha asks, thank you very much. Amazing poem. And yes, Julie Anderson has shared the links here. So thank you, Julie, for sharing them. Uh, Joan says, I was told to go home in London in the 70s, looking too Italian. Have also had experiences here in the US, racist, especially when I tan. Okay, at least they told you to go home. Um, my parents who were Lebanese were told to go to Mexico. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's pretty much the same. Um, Glenda uh, asks, how has your experience and background affected uh, by your sense of home? Well, I think in, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, when I get this question, I often quote what my friend who's from Sierra Leone, what he said to me once. And he moved to this country when he was 13. And he said that I didn't know I was black until I came to Europe. And I was just like, well, what do you mean? And he goes, in Sierra Leone, there's no black people. It's just Africans or people from Sierra Leone. And black people is a European <laughs> invention. And so he goes, when I came here, and I think Tanishi Coates talks about this, you know, in Between the World and Me, you have this idea that if you grow up in a very homogenized space and you leave that space, you're made to feel othered. And I kind of feel that, I think what happened to me is that I was made aware of my otherness when I was 11, 12 years old by the kids in school. And so, you know, when people are saying, yeah, but you're not white, you're Cypriot. I, was, I don't know. And then I'll go home and I'll be like, dad, some kid said that I'm not white. He said, I'm Cypriot. Then my dad, we're talking about, of course you're white, you're Greek. I'm like, so why did he say I was Cypriot? He said, you're not Cypriot, you're Greek. I'm like, all right, but we don't have any family in Greece. Like, we come from Cyprus. Yeah, but someone 2,000 years ago would have come from Greece. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it, it, it gets to that point. And it was just very confusing because you had all these different people telling you different things about who you were. Um, and, yeah, you know, like it, it, it was exactly – I mean, even now with the census over here, if you go into the white other section, you can tick Turkish, Greek, or Cypriot, or Greek, Cypriot, or Turkish Cypriot. Then if you go into the other section and you specify what race you are, Cypriot also comes up there. So you can essentially fit into two boxes, you know, because it's so weird and confusing. And Cypriots don't know. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I say something quickly again? Yeah. I was going to say, and I'm, I'm reading with you um, very gratefully tomorrow, and I want to say just my experience of being Lebanese, brought up in, born and brought up in London, you know, I had nothing like that experience of, of tension in terms of identity, really. I probably did and still do, like somewhere submerged in me, but it wasn't as um, uh, vocalized in my, or as important to me as I grew up. I, I'm not sure, but I think because I grew up in a bit of a bubble, I grew up very privileged, firstly. So I do think that there are other factors in identity that can actually kind of rub away at least the surface of the, the urgency of identity politics. Yeah. If you grow up in a bit of a bubble like I did, um, you end up kind of, everything is smoother than, maybe it's not really there. Maybe the reality is not as smooth as it looks, but you feel it as much smoother. And to this day, when I write poetry, I often quote the Voltaire line at the end of Condit in my private garden. I write very personal poetry about family relations, but I very rarely am I politicized, precisely yeah. because I think I grew up always in this kind of very, you know, um, protected environment, right? So that the issues that are probably with me, like they are with you, didn't I didn't feel them as much. So it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing. They're probably there though. Yeah, and I think there's different kinds of political writing. You've got writing that is explicitly political, and then you've got writing that is implicitly political. And I think the very act of writing is a political act, you know? Like, whether you're writing about love, or you're, whether you're writing about walking through the forest with your... Oh, yeah. No, I agree with that, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think... Yeah, evaluations. Yeah, exactly. I don't think you can avoid... You can't oh, be... Yeah. You can't be apolitical. You can choose not to have an overt political stance on something. But well, even that is a political position. Yes, yes. No, no, I, no, I know that. But it just, I've just found it interesting because, you know, um, all, I've got loads of issues, loads of kind of tensions in me that drive me to write, drive me to create. But they, they very rarely had a, a, an objective 
articulation. They're always very subjective and personal. Um, and I just wanted to mention that it was, you know, it's a very different, I mean, for example, I don't, my Arabic is very weak. I speak the colloquial the Lebanese, you know, just get by with it. Yeah. When I go to Lebanon, people think of me as a foreigner because, you know, not, not necessarily because of uh, language not being too fluent, but because, you know, you grew up in a safety zone where they were, they went through a civil war. They had, they had lots more, you know, embodied experience of Lebanon than I'd ever had. So even if I spoke beautifully, I would still be thought of as other, not because of lack of Lebanese identity, but because I never had to go through what the Lebanese had to go through. And that defines who they are, you know, the, the tensions yeah. and, the, and the suffering. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Anyway, I just want to make a comment there because I'm, I'm going to be reading with you tomorrow. So uh, I'm a bit embarrassed because my poetry is very personal. It doesn't, it's not as, in, you know, as powerful as, you know, in, that, in the way you read some wonderful poetry there. Anyway, thanks. Thank you very much. Cheers, Omar. Thanks, man. Um, we have a comment by Adi Jamil. He says, it's really powerful and incredible how you talk about cultural diversity. Uh, oh, yeah, we read this question before. Sorry. Okay. Um, Right. Joan says, I agree that home is a condition. I carry home with me. Do you see that as different? Um, no, I think I think it is that. I mean, my I have a sense of home. I think that's what it is. It's a sense for me. And I sense home to be very much in London. I, I, people, when I go to Cyprus, people look more like me than what they do in London. But that's about it. It's like it's very kind of cosmetic in the fact that the customs I'm familiar with, the, I can see myself in the people, um, but then that's it. Like when it comes to being part of that tapestry, I, I feel we're disconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, Turkey, a Turkey asks, is masculinity taught or is it natural? Uh, I, I, my personal thing on this is that, yeah, masculinity is very much a social condition. It's very much taught behavior. It's learned behavior. You learn it through. I mean, I have a child, I have a five-year-old son, and I see how he picks up certain uh, behavioral patterns by watching other men and how he gravitates towards men in a different way than he gravitates towards women, although he's much closer with his mum. It's really interesting. So, yeah, I, I, I would say is that. And also there's a great book, if anyone's interested, called The Myth of Male Dominance um, that looks at matriarchal cultures and civilizations from around the world. And it shows you that how men behave in matriarchal societies. And it's very different to how they behave in patriarchal societies. I mean, there is a level of kind of, you know, you have got the idea of like bone density, height, testosterone. You have all these different things that science throws in the mix. But how you respond to those things will be determined by what is socially permissible. And interesting. The book is called The Myth of Male Dominance, as you mentioned. Okay. Uh, Khalfan asks, what feeds you your passion to write poems and at this length? Um, I, I have a very obsessive personality. Um, I'm, I, you know, I, I just think about stuff all the time. I can't really turn off. And I think that kind of head energy needs to go somewhere. And I find that with art, it's a place for me to ask questions. It's a place for me to explore and to have fun, like to play. And so all of those things, which are, I guess are all part of my personality, will coalesce and consolidate in a, in a poem. And so the unusual imagery, the playfulness, the lyric, all that is the, you know, that's one aspect. But then you have the intellectual kind of inquiry, the historical referencing. That's another interest of mine. That I, yeah, so I just kind of fold it all in all in together and that's what keeps it going i'm halfway through another collection that's coming out in 2023 i believe um yeah so uh, that's what i do all right uh, a question from mandy mandy says you said that you believe that english is a race but british is a nationality i just wanted to ask what you believe that being a cypriot is a race or a nationality yeah and i think it goes back to that isn't it like you have um people that are born in cyprus now that are filipino that are russian that are from indonesia and they're as cypriot but i think i see cypriot in this sense as lineage you know like tracing your lineage back and obviously like where do you draw the line you know do you trace it back 50 years or trace it back five thousand years at what point do you but i think it is necessarily about you know 
your great grandfather, your great grandmother, your you know this. You can trace your family back to the island. It's very different. I can't trace my family back to England. My Englishness starts in 1957, um, and that's it. But I think I know a lot of people that do like to say, you know, that they are English, and I think that's fine. That, that obviously that their family are from other countries, but um, yeah, with me, I don't. I see English very much as a race of people, um, in a way that yeah, like I can be. Uh, the problem with them, the problem with this discussion is that you had the British Empire. It wasn't called the English Empire. It was called the British Empire, and so London and England is a reflection of how diverse the British Empire was. That's why you have that. So it was the same in Rome. Rome was an incredibly diverse empire. Same with the Ottoman. So wherever you have huge levels of colonization, you're going to have that reflected within the metropole. And that's kind of what's happened. Right. Um, Mariam Wajdi, Emirati poet, also says, Anthony, your work is brilliant and I am speechless. It just left me in thought and all I can say is I have a lot to think about. I found myself seeing your imagery and lost in it. Amazing, uh, thank you. Sheikha, Sheikha Al-Khamiri, uh, I believe also a poet, says, I love the poems. They're very powerful and reflect the situation a lot of people face, not only in the past, but e even today, especially with the war and the mi immigration of people, race and ethnicity is huge part and it's really annoying and unfair to feel that you are not part of a place that you totally belong to. Thank you very much. Dr. Alan Hickman says, I'm having connectivity. Oh, sorry, never mind. <laughs> um, Ahmad Sharif Dean says, I was born in the US and grew up in Canada, but I look like my father, who is from the Middle East. I um, liked my parents' culture and country, but I hated when I was constantly being asked, Where am I from while I lived in Canada? So I'm relating to what you are saying. Uh, Michael Black. Uh, asks, what are you working on next? I believe Michael's joining us from Scotland. Um, so what are you working on next? You just mentioned, Anthony, that you have another uh, collection coming up in 2023. Would you want to say anything about it or would you want to leave it as a surprise? Yeah, I'll leave it. I mean, it's still a work in progress. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, it's very different from what After the Formality. I think I'd work something out in After the Formalities. I've worked out an aesthetic. I've worked out a voice, a, a style, a way of kind of, of seeing and thinking that I'm basically expanding on in this next book. Okay. Um, Anthony uh, Huen. Anthony, I believe you're joining us from Singapore, I think. Uh, Anthony is also a poet, and he says, would you have any advice for anyone wanting to write poetry to negotiate different identities? Um, I think, you know, when it comes to this thing, my only thing, it, my only advice is don't write about identity for identity's sake. I think personality is more interesting. I think individuals are more interesting. Um, I think people can get bogged down in the identity because like, it's a marketeer's term, right? Identity politics, identity poetry. It doesn't really exist. I mean, even in the even in the 17th century, you write about yourself. You are writing about things that constitute your identity in some shape or form. So I would write about you as an individual rather than trying to kind of fit into this kind of collective group experience that I don't think is necessarily accurate. Or I don't even think it exists. I think everyone experiences reality in different ways at different times. And so I think writing about your truth and your self is far more conducive than trying to negotiate a dual heritage, double consciousness, double identities. Like it just gets very messy. So I think, yeah, looking at yourself is much more interesting. Right. Uh, a question from Lorenzo Caligaris. Lorenzo asks, what societies would you define as matriarchal societies? Um, to research more on the topic. Okay, interesting question, Lorenzo. Do they exist, Anthony? Do we still have uh, matriarchal societies? There's the, the Napsaki, who are a North American uh, tribe, uh, I believe. They are matriarchal. They're, they are small tribes in parts of Africa, Nigeria, uh, West Africa predominantly that are still matriarchal um, things such as you um, the men will stay at home the women will go out the women are involved in 
And this is like, you know, you're talking about small bands of people, but it's still it's still that the women are involved in policy making. They make the decisions. The men stay at home with the children. Um, and what's interesting is um, the way that crying and emotion is seen as being a very masculine thing. And to be kind of more resilient, to be slightly more conservative is a, a female thing. So it completely turns this biological notion that women cry easier, men don't, blah, 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 you know. It's just it turns it all on its head. If you read the book, it's actually very, very well detailed. And she goes through like the histories of, of these groups of people. And women are encouraged to have several um, sexual partners, you know, at the same time in the way that men are encouraged to sow their seed and so on and so forth. And promiscuity is doesn't even exist. It's about scarcity, you know. So there's loads of different things that if men are going and fighting in wars. There's a scarcity of men. Women are encouraged to have three, four different sexual partners to have children with them uh, to keep the thing, you know, keep it growing. So, yeah, there's a lot of it that comes back to that. So I think yeah, the book was really interesting. Very interesting. Yes. <laughs> uh, Carol, Carol says racial and ethnic tensions are so charged and it is so important to talk about them. Anthony's poetry opens up this territory in ways that generate constructive conversation. I'm also reminded of Wallace Stevens, quote, it is the violence within that protects us from the violence without. A fine balance to be sure. And a correction, uh, sorry, poet Anthony Huen is joining us from Hong Kong, not from Singapore. Sorry, Anthony. Okay, and uh, Mariam has another uh, comment. I agree with Anthony on this. Poetry should never be forced. It should come from you naturally, who you are and what you believe and slash or care about. Thank you, Anthony. So uh, would anyone else like to use the microphone to ask a question? Is there anyone here who would like to say one more thing? Okay, I guess those were the comments and the questions. Um, Miriam says, congratulations to Anthony. Thank you, Miriam. I'm pretty sure everybody enjoyed this wonderful talk. And um, Anthony, would you like to read something else before we, we conclude the session? Um, I'm, 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 I'm trying find something short, something, okay. something fun. So this is once I had an acceptance speech. This is a... This is one about social pressures and social status. Driving too close to the curb, admit to being poor, stash pumpkin seeds for my kid, I hustle the Christian way. Starch my shirt collars, value a strong smudge. I give pigeons saintly names, cream both my feet. Recycle, sign off emails with warm regards, bubble tap, hashtag vegan, heart statuses which start with I am delighted to announce morning. I struggle to decide what mood to wear. Evenings, I lie beside my aftershaves imagining the sea. I should really have it by now, a Dyson, Panasonic bread maker, a photo by the piano of a slum tour. I need the spirit of a full moon party rather than a charisma of a shed. They honk when I slow. I swear with my eyes, think of real blood. Sunday comes and my dad asks, what's the plan? I knit him the only winning scratch card. I leave a candle on for destiny once. I had an acceptance speech written. Soon a staircase will rise to defeat us all. The roads have moved. When I get in, I'll sit in the shower and say it's a bath. Double tap an ultrasound pick. Sick railroad water. Notification. Zank one started following you. Check my speed. Slap on another Barry Manilow playlist. Keep my grays in the dashboard. Wonder what the guy who put a gun to my little brother's head is doing for New Year's. Wonder if my neighbor made it through. Up ahead, a badger's hit beside a boulder. It's glare, a wooden egg. I slow for. Wow. Thank you so much. This is, I mean, so many little details, quotidian, you know, mundane details put into such beautiful poetry. Thank you, Anthony, for this. And I would like to say a few things before we um, say goodbye for tonight. Anthony will be reading with us tomorrow. So tomorrow's poetry grand finale uh, will include Anthony's poetry. Fiona Sampson will be joining us again. So will Ruth Fidel. 
and uh, Dr. Omar Sabah and uh, this one here. So uh, it's going to be at the same time, 6 p.m. Dubai time, which is 3 p.m. in London and uh, 10 a.m. EST, I believe. Um, again, you can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, whatever you use. Uh, you'll be getting updates. You'll be receiving the recording to today's session. Um, Anthony will also be giving a workshop uh, this Saturday. Uh, would you want to say something about it, Anthony, or uh, share a link yeah. or something? Yeah, it sold out, that one. Um, there was oh, only okay. two spaces, so yeah, that one's well, done. Well, lucky for me, then. I got to get a seat before it was sold out. But uh, Anthony does this regularly, uh, so if you would follow Outspoken Poetry on Twitter or go to the website, then you will also find all the schedule of when the sessions are being given. And they're, for the time being, they're online and virtual. Um, and thank you again. I'm greatly looking forward to seeing everyone again tomorrow. And um, you now know where to get after the formalities from. And if you would like to read about Anthony's Road Toward Poetry, which is unbelievably amazing because it wasn't an easy road and there's just so much to learn from it and so much to look up to. So this is his new book, How to Write It. There are also some great exercises for writing poetry that everyone I believe can benefit from. Um, we have another comment or two. Oh, okay. Uh, people are asking for the link for tomorrow's poetry event. Right. I will share the link right now. Um, okay, so basically, this is a registration link, just like today's. So you will register and then an email will be sent to you with the access link. All right. So here it is. Okay, many thanks again and wishing everyone a great afternoon, evening, good night, good morning, maybe. Some of you are joining us from California and it is still very early. Uh, thanks again, Anthony. See you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your lovely words. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right.